Hello, my name is Alex Ormanishan. I'm a PhD student at KTH in Stockholm, Sweden, and a software engineer with Logical Clocks. Today I will present time travel and provenance for machine learning pipelines. Machine learning pipelines have become the de facto paradigm for productionizing models. Pipelines abstract the processing steps involved in transforming raw data into engineered features later used to train your models. These pipelines are of course even more complex than what we're showing here, with more stages, each stage running as its own application, and each of these applications reading its input from a storage, in some cases an object store, but more often a distributed file system. And of course writing their output as well to this uh, storage. Provenance involves logging the operations in your platform in order to be able to link together applications with their input and output files, as well as system environment setup such as library versions, together with application configuration parameters. This allows us to build a history of events that can be traversed and queried for relevant information. What we want is to be able to add relations between our various entities to our provenance graph. For example, we might want to add feature engineering application, read some raw data, and produce a set of features. This can be naively achieved by adding into our code hooks to external libraries, such as the ones we have here, add feature engineering, raw data as input, features as output, and expect the external library to do the provenance tracking for us. However, we strive to keep this machine learning code as clean and clear as possible. So we would expect the platform itself to do the tracking and provide us with the provenance information without us having to modify our code. This provides us with two mechanisms that can track provenance, an explicit one and an implicit one. The explicit version, as we showed before, involves adding hooks in your code calls to external libraries that track provenance. This has the benefit of being expressive. The user knows what he wants, and the external libraries can have very rich APIs. On the other hand, you have to modify your own code and add provenance-related calls in there. On the other spectrum, we have implicit provenance, where we expect the running platform itself, the distributed file system, the resource manager, to keep track of our access patterns and to infer these relations itself. However, going down these applications, the stack, the library level, then the metadata store to reach the file system, we will lose a lot of information we will lose a lot of context that the applications have. Thus, our running platform has to infer these contexts back from something. We will try to help the platform by following certain conventions in our uh, work. Before we continue, we would ask the questions, why do we track provenance? In order to be compliant with GDPR, for example, so for governance reasons, in order to enhance discovery. And here we're not only talking about full text search on artifact names, but we want to be able to search for full workflows on how a particular artifact is being used. Or we might want to see which art other artifacts were produced in a similar fashion. For debugging purposes, while running a training stage, we might have an issue with it. We might reach a failure. The first thing that we can do is we can look at the input files of our stage and compare it with previous runs that ended successfully. Is anything missing? The next one would be analyzing your results. You have just trained the model and you want to see how good it is. You want to compare the metrics that you've evaluated with previous runs of the same model. Are they better? Maybe you want to save it. If not, you want to tweak your uh, model and generate a new one. Then we go into pipeline automation. Uh, pipelines can be linked together and typically they can be scheduled to run at different times. In case one of the pipeline fails or one of the stage fails, 
we want to be able to automatically rerun it because maybe this was a transient error. We want to rerun the stage or maybe we want to rerun the whole pipeline. Another issue can occur if these failures are not so visible. So what does this mean? One of the artifacts that we produced as output, a model has bias in it or a training data set has invalid data. Now all other models that were created based on our training data set or all the applications that were using our biased uh, model are now in trouble. All of these are pipelines of their own and they are probably running in an automated fashion. Now if a developer discovers that this artifact was broken and fixes it, we would like the platform to help him and tell him what exactly he needs to restart, which pipelines need to be recomputed because they were computed based on bad artifacts. Or even the platform itself might automatically restart all of these pipelines. And the last one is integrity and garbage collection. Of course, as we said, each of the pipelines produce and use a lot of files from the file system. If a user is trying to delete a artifact that might be an input for one of the stages, we might want to warn him in order not to break that particular pipeline. Or if a pipeline is invalid, we might help the user to clean up the whole pipeline. He doesn't have to search for each of the uh, stages, what are the files that I need to delete. The platform itself knows all the input, temporary files, output, and it knows if, it, they, are, if they are still in use or not. System challenges involve the design of queries. So in our case, we have a number of artifacts, models, training datasets, features. They are stored as files on the disk, and we want to figure out what is the metadata that we want to track, what, what do we want to save. And for this, we look at the provenance queries that we are going to run later. Are we going to run SQL queries? Are we going to run time series queries? Are we going to run full text search or maybe pure graph queries? All of these will influence the way we store and what we store from our in our metadata. Throughput latency is also important. How fast can we manage to answer queries and how fast our metadata itself changes? Uh, all of these are important for designing the metadata extraction mechanisms. Another challenge, as we said before, is the consistency between metadata and data itself. If the artifacts are stored on a file system and the metadata is stored in some database and the two are not connected, there can be synchronization issues between the two. As, uh, as such, you would need to implement your own synchronization algorithm. So you would prefer still if the platform would keep these uh, synchronized. In our case, uh, we are trying to push all the provenance uh, tracking towards our file system as low as possible and make it transparent to the user. As we said before, raw data sets, features, models all have files on the disk. These files, whenever you access them, will trigger events that are captured by the change data capture API, further processed later by, by our data bus ePipe, and pushed into provenance. This provenance metadata can then be queried in SQL uh, queries, relational queries, graph queries, or full text search. Another challenge that we find ourselves trying to solve is the number of operations that we generate. These ML machine learning artifacts, such as training datasets, for example, can have a lot of files. Think about ResNet. It has a lot of images. Each of the image has its, is saved as a particular file on disk. Whenever you want to train a model, you will touch all of the files in this training dataset. Thus, you might generate thousands of operations. We want to add more context to the file system operations in order to be able to filter and to extract more out of these access patterns. So in the case of uh, pure file system operations, as we see on the left, user John has some green uh, operations on there, some reads, some uh, maybe appends, maybe some metadata uh, operations, and Alex has another bunch of operations in there. 
from this left figure we cannot figure we cannot deduce if there are any relations between green operations on the same file or green operations on different files if the blue the fact that the blue operations and the green operations interleave does it doesn't tell us much we can infer a lot more if we add a simple application id to this uh, to the file system operation tracking this allows us to make a window a bounded window around these operations it allows us to bound the time where we are looking at operation as well as associate the files that were used in the same operation in this case we can also see that application 2 and application 3 overlapped in their access on these particular files As we said before, we are trying to enrich this uh, file system operation tracking with as much context as we can in order to gain back what we have lost when we moved down in all those layers, application and uh, framework and uh, libraries. In this case, simply having the resource manager give us the application ID in the form of certificates and pushing this in the file system allows us to draw this boundary around the file system operations. In here, we see them as green. For this, we have at this point file, operation, user ID, and application ID. This gives us a relation between input and output files, for example, at the very least. By adding job manager context, in our case, Hopsworks, we can associate different applications that are actually runs of the same job. In our case, a job is can be seen as a blueprint of an application. However, we can run a job at multiple points in time, and all of these would be executions of the same job. Each of them would be a different application. Now we can link applications together, and their input files can be compared. We can add even more context in the form of workflow manager, in our case Airflow. This allows us to link together jobs that are part of the same stage, so that we can add meaning to them. A particular stages output can be the next stages input and thus we gain additional information. In order to deal with the multitude of operations that we generate in the file system, we are going to use conventions and in Hopsworks we use the following conventions. Features are stored in a directory, a dataset called feature store. Uh, models are stored in models. For example, another project, Maven, does similar things. It expects your files to be located in source main, and it will generate its output in target. This allows us to reattach parts of the context that we have lost and be able to say that this particular file is related to a particular artifact. So we can do this jump from file back to machine learning artifacts. These conventions allow us to implement this path-based filtering. This is a static configuration of our file system where we tell the file system that for paths defined by us as a particular regex expression, it should track provenance at its fullest, as is the case for our uh, green nodes which is a feature store, let's say, and then we have to track all the operations in the blue nodes. But this is not the case for the black nodes. Those might be logs, for example, that we do not uh, care to track all the operations that happen on them. So this path-based filtering is a static configuration in our cluster. If we want to have more a more dynamic configuration, we will add tag-based filtering. These tags are custom metadata that are attached to any file that we want. And these tags are attached under uh, by using X attribute operations. These are HDFS operations. These operations are run at the same level with the create file, delete file, read file, and thus allow us to know exactly when particular metadata was attached to a file and when it was deleted. In our case, for example, we could at runtime decide that a particular directory that was marked as do not track provenance, for our current case where we want to debug, we want to enable provenance. And then we can enable it temporarily and disable it later. 
by removing the tag. Uh, even in this form, we might still generate way too many operations. The previous two mechanisms allowed us to turn off complete uh, subtrees, but the subtree that is left, the green one, can still generate quite a bunch of operations. And in our case, for example, for a training data set, the ResNet, where we are touching a lot of files, are we really interested in knowing that each of the file was read? Or what we really want to know is that ResNet training data set was accessed. So this means coalescing all the read files into one operation access training data set. We can further uh, reduce the amount of operations that uh, we are tracking if we uh, are okay with reducing the amount of information, provenance information that we will save. For example, only saving create and delete operations will allow us to uh, check for artifact, artifact existence. We are tracking very few operations, we gain little information. We can add tracking X attribute operation and thus we can know exactly when metadata was linked to the artifacts. We can further track read operations and thus know when an artifact was used in a particular stage. The finer grained operations you, uh, the finer grained information you want in the provenance, the more operations we have to track. If you are willing to give up some of this, we might uh, be able to reduce the number of operations that we are tracking. This is how a uh, ML pipeline looks in Hopsworks. The feature store uh, feeds data into the model training and then all of the models are saved in a model repository which can be loaded in order to be served to different applications. All of these components trigger uh, change data capture events that are captured and pushed into our provenance uh, layer in the metadata store. Why is it important? Well, maybe you have detected at some point bias in your model. What do we do now? Well, you would like to be able to go back in time and be able to debug your pipeline at that specific time with its input, its code, and its uh, system configuration. Uh, if you had version one of a particular library and now version two is installed, you don't want to run your uh, pipeline with version two if you are trying to debug a model that was built with version one. As such, using provenance, you can traverse all of these uh, dotted uh, links and the application, you can see which, uh, like at what time it's using the served model and you can infer the version of the model that's used. Then continuing on the links, you can determine what training application generated the model and you can see what exactly did it read and not only what it read but at what point in time it read and for example for our feature store we are not storing different versions of the same feature at different points in time however we are using hoodie which allows us to store deltas so that every time we do a change in our in one feature in our feature store we add a new delta there this allows us to uh, regenerate it, any version of this feature at any point in time by knowing which range of delta commits we want to generate our feature from. And the provenance can give us this particular timestamp, let's say, that allows us to build the blue feature store and leave out that uh, white uh, suffix, for example. In conclusion, as machine learning pipelines are becoming more and more complex, we want any mechanism that can help us understand it better and provenance can help us with this. However, we want mechanisms that do not make us change the, uh, the machine learning code. We want to keep that one clear and uh, as free as possible of any other code other than machine learning. Provenance facilitates debugging, analyzing, automating, and cleaning of machine learning pipelines, which are features that we want. And with provenance and time travel, we can move back and debug a pipeline at its time in, uh, uh, that was generated. Thank you. This is the team that was involved in uh, developing this.